Good afternoon and welcome to the University of South Dakota Knutson School of Law Federalist Society event with Josh Hammer on common good originalism. My name is Anthony Leonardi and I'm the president of the Federalist Society student chapter here at the University of South Dakota. And today we're here to have a discussion with Josh on judicial philosophy. In recent years, Josh has made waves in the legal sphere of the United States with his essay on common good originalism in the Harvard Journal of Law and Public Policy, which calls upon conservatives to, quote, engage in sober contemplative self-reflection to reassess our first principles, retire our outmoded bromides, and rebalance prudence and dogma anew to reach a jurisprudence that actually serves our substantive goals. Josh is an opinion editor of Newsweek, a research fellow with the Edmund Burke Foundation, counsel and policy advisor for the Internet Accountability Project, a syndicated columnist through creators and a contributing editor for, the American, for Anchoring Truths. A frequent pundit and SES on political, legal, and cultural issues, Josh is a constitutional attorney by training and the co-host of two podcasts, Newsweek's The Debate and Edmund Burke's Foundation's, the Edmund Burke Foundation's NatCon Squad. An outspoken conservative, Josh opines on conservative intellectual trends, contemporary domestic and foreign policy debates, constitutional and legal issues, and the intersection of law, politics, and culture. He has been published by many leading outlets, including the New York Post, Newsweek, National Affairs, National Review, The Spectator, The American Mind, The Daily Wire, and Fox Business, just to name a few. Uh, prior to his time in media, Josh worked at a large, large law firm and clerked for a judge in the United States Court of Appeals for the Fifth Circuit. Josh has also served as a John Marshall Fellow with the Claremont Institute. He graduated from Duke University where he majored in economics and from the University of Chicago Law School. He now lives in Miami, but remains an active member of the State Bar of Texas. Josh, it's good to speak with you. Great to speak with you. Thanks so much for having me virtually. Sorry I couldn't make it there in person. One quick note, this is not your fault. I need to update my bio on the FedSoc website. You can ignore the whole Newsweek's The Debate thing. I actually have my brand new podcast out that launched two months ago called The Josh Hammer Show at Newsweek. So shameless plug, would encourage everyone to go ahead and check that out. And so I, I guess there's, I suppose there's no better first question than to simply ask you first, what is common good originalism? Yeah, so um, I think in order to answer that question, we have to do some table setting first. We need to like kind of um, understand like where I'm coming from and where this first essay was coming from. So um, the Harvard Journal of Public Policy essay, which I published in June 2021, um, was kind of building off of some smaller um, previous essays, the first of which was a May 2020 shorter essay that I wrote for the Claremont Institute's American Mind Journal. Um, at the time, it was initially formulated as a direct response to my friend Adrian Vermeule's essay at The Atlantic magazine. Adrian has now you know, written a full book-length version of his proposal for what he calls, quote-unquote, common good constitutionalism. Adrian, of course, in that essay, kind of, um, uh, you know, he repeatedly has, to, to this day, he emphatically embraces the mantle of Ronald Jorkin. Ronald Jorkin, of course, is, is historically most closely affiliated with kind of left-wing uh, living constitutionalism, if you will. This is the notion that kind of the original meaning or original intent or any of that does not particularly matter. It, it, it does not or should not play a particularly meaningful role in constitutional interpretation, kind of making an express unequivocal pitch for principles of political morality being imbued into the constitutional structure. So when I was, when I was first formulating common good originalism, I was trying to kind of deliberately trying, trying to leave kind of a stable middle ground, trying to take a lot of this kind of um, intellectual momentum that kind of the so-called new right more broadly has done as far as trying to kind of, um, you know, more, more fight more aggressively and moralistically, uh, if that's even a word, moralistically, um, they're trying to kind of take that and try and cabinet within kind of the nomenclature, phraseology, constructs, paradigms of originalism and originalist theory as it has existed for the past 30, 40 years. So I, I, to kind of go back even further, though, historically, because like I, I really don't think it makes sense unless we kind of do that. If you kind of go back to the founding of FedSoc in 1982, this is the 40th anniversary, of course, this in the year 2022, the fa that first wave of federal society luminaries, folks like the late Justice Scalia, the late Judge Bob Bork, Attorney General Ed Meese during the Reagan administration, Professor Steve Calabresi, who's still teaching at Northwestern Law School, the original form of originalism, I guess we might say, um, was kind of, they wouldn't describe it this way, but from my perspective, it looks like it was effectively positivist and historicist. And what I mean by that was it was emphasizing that you would very, very strictly narrowly interpret kind of the, the confines of the pages within the constitution. And you would do so without any kind of reference whatsoever to kind of external principles of morality. 
And um, this would this process will be done in an effectively a, a historical process, right? You would kind of just look back to kind of what clauses or words meant at a given time. And, um, you know, this was done really to try to get this ship back on the rails because of what the Warren and Burger Courts had done for the past 25, 30 years prior to that and all the various excesses in areas such as criminal procedure, substantive due process, things like that. So the first wave of originalists was more positivist historicists and it was really heavy on judicial restraint. At some point in like the late 90s, early 2000s, you saw the rise of what I would refer to as libertarian originalism that's most closely affiliated with kind of my former professor, Richard Epstein, of course, Professor to Randy Barnett at Georgetown Law School. I think libertarian originalism would kind of borrow its, uh, its modus operandi, if you will, from a subtitle of Professor Barnett's 2004 book. That book was entitled Recovering the Lost Constitution, The Presumption of Liberty. The presumption of liberty kind of being the that is what libertarian originalism is like you interpret clauses and words through the analytical prism of maximizing liberty of maximizing individual autonomy at any and all costs and by contrast shrinking government um and then you know the the, the third branch of originalism that kind of has previously existed would be professor jack balkan's conception of quote unquote living or progressive originalism which uh, you know, I'm told is not an oxymoron. The way that, that I'm told this works is that like the original meaning of these clauses, these broadly phrased clauses in the first, fourth, ninth, fourteenth amendment clauses like that, was specifically meant to kind of delegate to future generations the ability to kind of update this document with kind of evolving norms of morality, decency, and so forth. Right. So as a conservative, I kind of look at that playing field and I say, well, where is my substantive, where is my substantively methodologically originalist strand of jurisprudence? The first school is, you know, conservative insofar as we equate conservatism with judicial restraint. I think that would be an error. There's nothing intrinsically conservative about that. Um, judicial philosophy and constitutional interpretation, I think, are not the same thing. They are two independent things. This libertarian original libertarian originalism, excuse me, is intrinsically methodologically libertarian insofar as it is oriented towards the maximization of individual liberty and the minimization of government. Similarly, progressive originalism is intrinsically progressive because it is enti entirely premised on the ability of kind of subsequent generations to update with evolving morality. So nothing here is particularly conservative, honestly. And as a, as a conservative, so I mean, con this gets back to like what is conservatism, right? But as someone who kind of values uh, things um, like order, structure, virtue, hierarchy, family, community, nation, state, God, um, just as much, if not more so, of course, than liberty, there's nothing there that's particularly intrinsically conservative. So what I do is I kind of thought about this a little bit, and I also thought a little bit more about what is law, right? What actually makes law? What kind of makes something worthy of respect as law qua law, not just kind of empty words written on a piece of paper? And I would submit to you that the, what makes a law law is that the words on the paper, the laws that are, that are purporting to be law are actually oriented Towards certain, towards certain ends of humanity, of community, of, of human anthropology, and ultimately trying to yield um, human flourishing and the common good. If something is actually oriented to those ends, then it is worthy of respect as law. By contrast, if it is not oriented to those ends, so for example, I'm thinking here of the, you know, the dictatorial edicts from the Fuhrer during Nazi Germany to give like a, 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 a real you know, strong example, that's not worthy of respect as law because the, the words that are written are not oriented towards substantively just ends. But as the case may be, um, the ends of the American experiment in Republican self-governance, our wonderful experiment, our wonderful experiment in order liberty, um, the uh, you know what Aristotle called the telos, what I re re also called the telos, kind of the substantive overarching orientation of our entire constitutional order, are both just and explicitly written down. And they're actually written down, I cite them right here, in the preamble of the Constitution. And the preamble of the Constitution, just to be pedantic for a second, reads, we the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity, do ordain and establish this Constitution for the United States of America. So if you're listening to that carefully, and you can obviously read it yourselves, the ends of governance that are enumerated in there, they're not particularly libertarian. There's really not a whole lot in there about kind of the, uh, the maximization of liberty and the shrinking of government being the quintessence, the end-all be-all as to why governments are instituted among men. 
Rather, the preamble is more concerned about common defense, general welfare, more perfect union, establishing justice. That's a, that's a substantive term. So really, the, my basic claim is uh, for common good originalism is twofold. One is because I'm a traditional kind of Burkean conservative, and I believe um, you know, I, 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 the phrase I usually use is kind of epistemological humility, meaning that I think Burke basically says that we cannot be too certain about that which we think we know. We should be skeptical of the ability of humans to kind of decisively reach conclusions. So for that matter, I kind of question that first wave of originalists, the more positivist historical school, I question their, um, their claimed ability to definitively discern kind of the easy right and wrong answers all the time. Obviously, there are some very easy questions, okay? Seventh Amendment, $20 amount in controversy, 35 years old, age of eligibility for presidential run, things like that are straightforward. But I think that they kind of overstated their claims for where various clauses are just really, really, really straightforward, whether it's the 14th Amendment, Fourth Amendment, things like that. So I start from, with a broader so-called construction zone of um, legitimate interpretive plausibilities um, for at least various kind of contested words and clauses. Then the question is, what do you do when you're in that that so-called construction zone. Well, my fairly modest claim is that we should err on the side of the telos of the American regime, that judges who are acting as kind of lowercase r Republican schoolmasters, as Ralph Lerner would call it, who are trying to kind of remind us most fundamentally of who we are within the limited confines of the Article III judicial power, should un unapologetically interpret these clauses through the end, through the end goal of trying to channel the animating spirit of the Constitution, the telos of the constitutional order, and trying to construe provisions through that lens. So there's all sorts of kind of um, you know possible kind of uh, implications of that and examples of that, but um, we can kind of get into that a little later if you want. Yeah, um, and one of the things that you mentioned too is sort of the development of originalism, whether it be libertarian, uh, the sort of oxymoron of progressive originalism, um, and it, it sort of speaks to one of the first lines that you opened up your essay on. And it says, on the one hand, legal conservatism, originalism, and textualism have never been more ascendant and better positioned within the legal academy and mainstream political discourse. But on the other hand, the state of conservative jurisprudence in America has reached a crisis point. What do you think that crisis point is? Was it a result of sort of the positivist originalism that you mentioned earlier? Was it a result of, or just a lacking focus on a substantive conservatism? It seems to me that the crisis point is that originalism as a methodology has become so pervasive, borderline ubiquitous in our contemporary legal, political, and judicial culture. It's become so ubiquitous that Elena Kagan, you know, at her, at her confirmation hearing for the Supreme Court, famously felt compelled to say, "quote unquote, we're all originalists now," and that's like standard. That's just the way it's done. Obviously, Ketanji Brown Jackson at her recent Senate Judiciary Committee confirmation hearing basically said the same thing, actually. If you look at what she said, she basically said, oh, uh, the way we do constitutional interpretation now is normally a, a historical process where you look back and look at what the original meaning or the original ratification meant. So it, the, the paradox is that this movement, the modern conservative legal movement, has been profoundly successful in terms of kind of the dissemination of its ideology and kind of its march through the institutions, if you will, um, you know, five of the nine Supreme Court justices, right, are, are current or former Federal Society members, are self-identified originalists of some stripe, um, you know, numerous kind of United States senators, whether it's Ted Cruz, Mike Lee, Josh Hawley, Tom Kahn, folks like that, kind of came up through the Federal Society's ranks. Originalism really has become, it, it, it has gone from, from an extremely kind of um, caricatured and oftentimes ridiculed constitutional interpretive methodology. I think back to when Bob Bork was nominated for the Supreme Court in the late 1980s, uh, all the horrific smears that Ted Kennedy and Joe Biden said about him back then, um, back when originalism was in its kind of relative infancy, was just dismissed as this radical theory. Now it's become like totally mainstream. The paradox is that it has become so mainstream and ubiquitous, but what have we actually achieved? What have conservatives actually achieved? What have we gotten out of this? And I would submit to you that we have actually not gotten a whole lot. Now, I'm a big gun rights guy. I, I, I own numerous guns. I have a concealed carry license, all that stuff. I, I, I'm a big Second Amendment proponent. That is one area where I can say, wow, we actually have been successful. Okay, so DC versus Heller, 
the McDonald versus Chicago. I do note, though, that they have done the court has done nothing since the McDonald case in 2010. There was a current case out of New York State that, that is up. Um, you know, we'll find out in like a month or two what the court is going to do with respect to kind of um, open or concealed carrying. But they have done absolutely nothing even on that issue over the past 12 years. They've continually kind of swatted down cert petitions, trying to kind of expand the holdings of hell or McDonald. But that's the closest thing that I can find to kind of a jurisprudential area where we really have had success. Um, on religious liberty, we've basically played to a draw. Uh, Bostock, um, the Title VII case where Justice Gorsuch famously interpreted, uh, quote, on the basis of sex, to me on the basis of sex, sexual orientation or gender identity. Um, you know, that was a loss for religious liberty, but we otherwise have generally played to a draw. I would submit to you that we have not gone further than that. Um, in the case last June, kind of uh, the, the Fulton versus City of Philadelphia case out of um, you know, at the state of Pennsylvania, we had we had an opportunity to overturn Employment Division versus Smith, the 1990 case that, that I would argue kind of trampled on religious liberty. Um, the court did not do so because Justices Kavanaugh and Barrett kind of chickened out, for lack of a better term. And there really aren't that many other areas where I can point to and say we're definitively winning. I mean, even on something as kind of abstruse in the weeds as kind of Chevron deference, which is kind of a libertarian bugaboo, right? That's, that's kind of that's a kind of topic that makes like the George Mason University Law School faculty lounge kind of like shriek up and joy. We, we, we haven't even been able to overturn Chevron deference, right? Um, you know, I think back, I think about the, the lemon test, which is kind of the infamous kind of establishment clause test when it comes to the first moment, a terrible, terrible decision. Um, you know, Justice Scalia famously liked to joke that Lemon, uh, in, in like the old horror movies, was like this zombie who he thought was dead and then would like wake up in the middle of the night to like remind you it's still alive. So Lemon is somehow still alive. I mean, we thought that we might, we might be able to overturn it in the 2019 Bladensburg Cross case. Um, we were not able to do so. So what have we done? Um, I, I, I just don't know. And it's actually worse than that because on, on many kind of impactful, meaningful cases, we have now seen self-proclaimed originalists or self-proclaimed textualists who have kind of taken their training, their indoctrination, if you will, into kind of this positivist, historicist school of originalist thought, and they have taken it it's to lead to totally kind of risable, farcical conclusions. And I'm thinking here of things like Justice Gorsuch in the Bostock case of 2020. So, you know, I, I basically share Senator Josh Hawley's point when he came to the Senate floor the day after the Bostock case in June 2020, where Senator Hawley basically said, you know, if these words originalism, textualism have gotten to this, if their widespread adoption had gotten to this, then what do those words even mean? I mean, have we, have we lost any kind of meaningful sense as to what we're actually going after at the expense of this ideology becoming so ubiquitous? Put another way. If Elena Kagan and Katandi Brown Jackson can plausibly claim to doing originalist um, analysis, you know, I mean, like wink, wink, nudge, nudge. <clears throat> excuse me, they're not doing that. Um, you know, Helena Kagan dissented in like the Obergefell case, for goodness sake. So they're not actually doing that. But if they can like semi plausibly claim with a straight, you know, poker face on that they are doing originalism, then surely originalism hasn't lost a sense of what it was meant to be. And if you go back and look at what it was meant to be in, in 1982 when the Federal Society was founded, it was really kind of predominantly focused on kind of like two schools or two broad areas. One was overturning kind of the Warren and Burger Court's kind of criminal procedure cases. I'm thinking here of cases like Matt versus Ohio, that's the exclusionary rule case, Miranda versus Arizona, that's a famous Fourth Amendment Miranda rights case. Um, Attorney General Ed Meese famously said if he could overturn one case and one case only, he would overturn Miranda versus Arizona. I can't even tell you the last time Miranda versus Arizona has come up at a Fed stock event. It's probably been years. Um, the other category, of course, then were like the proverbial culture war cases, um, you know, Griswold versus Connecticut, Roe versus Wade, right to privacy, substance due process. Um, we'll see what happens in the Jackson versus women's health case, obviously, whole women's health in a couple months as it pertains to Roe versus Wade. But the, the, the locus, the center of gravity of originalism and the way that it is kind of practiced has really kind of shifted closer to kind of like administrative state issues to kind of more kind of um, economic issues, libertarian issues, we've really kind of lost any kind of meaningful sense, I think, as to what this was actually supposed to be. And I, I want to ask you about the substantive ends a bit about um, common good originalism, because um, as you mentioned earlier, that the blessings of liberty seems to indicate that liberty is an instrumental means towards what the substantive end was. And um, and with that considered, would you say that one component of common good originalism can be characterized as uh, constitutional intentionalism or constitutional purposivism? 
um, to borrow, I guess, a word from uh, Justice Breyer? Yeah, so look, I, um, I think that we in the legal right have been a little too quick over the decades to dismiss um, anything that hints at interpreting a statute through kind of the natural order or the natural kind of orientation or short sure, just purpose as to where it fits in our rule of law, where it fits in our kind of United States code of legal statutes, where it fits into our constitutional order more broadly. Um, the phrase that I use over and over again in the Harvard Journal of Law and Public Policy issue is I kind of borrow from the great Sir, Sir William Blackstone. I use the Latin phrase ratio legis, which translates as reason of the law. Um, reason of the law is basically kind of what is the animating spirit, what is kind of um, you know, galvanizing the legislature or whoever kind of the lawmaking body or, or a publicitary body is to actually enact a various law. I think without understanding where a law fits in to the kind of the broader construct, it gets very difficult, obviously. That's exactly how you get to where Justice Gorsuch gets in the Bostock case, because you, it, it will lead you to forget that in the Bostock case example, that the Civil Rights Act of 1964 was about eradicating the horrific eagle of state-sanctioned Jim Crow segregation. To posit, to suggest the notion that it had anything whatsoever to do with sexual orientation, let alone quote-unquote gender identity, a construct that had not even been devised by the left-wing academy yet, is just, it's just farcical on its face here. And I do think that results like that can be partially attributable to kind of interpreting provisions through an, through an overly kind of narrow, overly kind of tunnel-visioned literalist lens and kind of forsaking the broader view of things. So I do think that kind of Rashi alleges the reason of the law. I, I do think that I think things that like the preamble of the constitution in the statutory context, the preamble of statutes, you know, the, the, the preambulatory language, it's, it's, it, it's really just ex, it's explicitly telling you what is galvanizing the people who are writing to do what they're doing. It's, it is putting the law in context there. Um, now, look, I mean, we can, we can obviously always take this too far, right? I mean, if the words on the page are extraordinarily clear, like like no ifs, ands, or buts, end of story, then the then I agree that kind of the judicial function effectively ends there, right? Um, but that often is not the case. And when we are looking for guidance, it is totally appropriate, I think, to look at kind of um, the broader kind of context, purpose, and structure as to where this fits into the broader edifice of our constitutional order. And the other uh, core tenet that you talk about that embodies common good originalism was the channeling the you described as channeling the rudimentary Burkean conceptions of epistemological humility, uh, because you say that the original public meaning of many other clauses in our majestic national charter is more susceptible to competing interpretations that are well within the range of historical plausibility, kind of the way that you see debates between Madison and Hamilton on uh, different clauses, and even though they both agreed about the Constitution. Um, so. In, in your opinion, um, what clauses or amendments do you see sort of the, a difference between a normative originalist and a common good originalist? Where, where, what is a, a clause that should be interpreted more broadly? Sure. So uh, I, I, I'm not sure I would necessarily use the, the term broadly, but I, but, I, but, I, but I can kind of kind of give you some examples as to what I mean here. So one good example as to where I think common good originalism would reach a different result than kind of the OG school of originalism, if you will, um, you know, would be the free speech clause of the First Amendment here. So, you know, I think a lot of modern legal conservatives, legal libertarians, people who are right of center have kind of, they've been taught or they've at least come to the conclusion that what it means to be kind of conservative or originalist on free speech issues is to kind of um, de facto um, you know, amount to kind of Voltaire and Leitman style kind of free speech absolutism. So I'm thinking here of lines like Anthony Kennedy's majority opinion from the Citizens United case of 2010. Justice Kennedy certainly was not originalist, but I think he spoke for many originalists when he said, and I'm paraphrasing here, I don't have it memorized verbatim, but he famously said, quote, you know, it is our law and our tradition that more speech, not less speech is the rule. Right. So that's basically saying that, you know, if you have a bad idea that or you're saying something mean or terrible, then just let me shout it out. Um, you know, I, I that is a view of free speech. You know, I would submit to you that that is not necessarily kind of the more conservative view. I certainly for I think a lot of folks who are more sympathetic uh, to, to something like the natural law tradition, there is kind of the notion that we should be kind of, um, uh, you know, our free speech jurisprudence should be guided 
uh, by at least some semblance of the intrinsic moral worth or moral dignity, or at least kind of the, at least at bare minimum, kind of the instrumental utility in that speech and effectively getting us to truth. That in theory is kind of the, uh, that, that in theory, by the way, is kind of the original um, understanding as to why free speech, open discourse, um, you know, the dialectic in the academy as to why that is in theory a good thing is because we're, we're supposed to be arriving at truth and it was historically thought then more speech will just lead to truth. Okay, so that kind of leads us to like a 2011 case, Snyder versus Phelps. Um, I, I'm not sure how many of y'all have cited this in for free speech or first moment in your common law classes. So Snyder versus Phelps is a free speech case. Um, Phelps is referring to uh, uh, Mr. Phelps. He has since passed away. He was a, uh, he was, he was a bad dude. Um, he led the Westboro Baptist Church, which, you know, unlike whatever the SPLC is calling a hate group these days, that the Westboro Baptist Church like actually is like a hate group. So what Phelps would do was he would go to, among other sorted activities, he would go to military funerals for people slain in Iraq and Afghanistan, places like that, and he would stand at kind of a public sidewalk, and he would just shout horrific epithets about um, the slain soldier, oftentimes kind of uh, in, you know, invoking homosexuality and things like that. And the question ends up getting litigated. The family of the slain soldier ends up litigating this case in the United States Supreme Court, you know, did Phelps have a free speech right to say these horrific things from the sidewalk, right? It's a public sidewalk after all. And the court says eight to one that he had a free speech right. The, the, those eight members include such stalwart originalists as the late Justice Scalia, as Justice Clarence Thomas. Um, in a very courageous solo dissent, Justice Sam Alito says no. He actually kind of reiterated this only a year or two later in a case called U.S. versus Stevens. It's kind of a very similar question. Uh, involving kind of the legality of so-called animal crush videos, which are disgusting videos peddled on the internet of these horrific, wretched human beings like killing their pets and animals. Um, similarly, an eight to one case, Alito's a sole dissenter saying that we can ban this stuff. And the basic argument, and I'm going back to Snyder versus Phelps, that's the, you know, the, the, um, the Westboro Baptist Church case. The basic argument is that this is so unmoored from anything remotely resembling our norms, our traditions. This is so fundamentally not with the goal of kind of pursuing truth, of pursuing justice, or pursuing any kind of understanding of human anthropology or, or community. It is, this has nothing to do whatsoever with human flourishing or the notion of, of a communitarian whole. It is actually undermining the communitarian whole. It's undermining the common good. It is destructive because it is taking direct aim at, at something as sacred as the United States military. And therefore, you know, he, he would say it was, it was, Alito would say it was farcical that you have a free speech right to do such a grievous wrong of this nature. He was kind of implicitly channeling there kind of um, the jurisprudence of Alexander Hamilton and his Federalist Party back from the First Party era in the 1790s. The Federalist Party famously took a slightly more restrictive view of speech, you know, obviously leading to things like the Alien Seditions Act, which, you know, I, I'm not necessarily saying I, I agree with all, with all the words in there, but I, I, that certainly was what they were trying to get after, at least. Um, so that would just be one, I think, clear example. Common good originalism would clearly err on the side of Justice Alito, where there is a provision here where you basically have two options. One is kind of maximizing individual autonomy, individual liberty to do what, say, whatever the heck you want to do, you know, to like self-identify whatever the heck you want to do on the one hand, or on the other hand, something that is clearly better for the community, something that's something better for the body politic, even if that, even if that means impinging on some on someone's um, idiosyncratic conception of liberty, uh, then we should err on the side of the latter. And you know, I, I have I have other examples as well, but I, I can kind of stop there for now. And now that the, the I wanted to ask you, now that the theory of common good originalism has been uh, proposed, it's going to be studied in the legal academic field, and after that, it's it will likely take hold in a tangible way by means of judges that ha holding that those views. Um, professors teaching it more, um, or or its integration to other prof uh, professions. Um, in what ways, for those who uh, find themselves identifying with common good originalism, should they seek to implement this approach um, into the law? Right. So I mean, look. I so I so just to clarify, like I literally coined the term common good originalism. I mean, so I it, it is not you know it's not going to happen overnight. There's not going to be like a like an overnight revolution. Obviously, now to, to be clear, I am trying to channel an older revolution. It's not like this is not like a particularly newfangled idea. Um, 
you know, to go back to the American founding, obviously, I mean, I think back to kind of the Helvidius Pacificus debates between Madison and Hamilton in the 1790s. They were warring over any number of issues, both Article One, Article Two, and to an extent, Article Three as well. Um, one particularly bitter dispute that they had was over the, the scope of the Necessary and Proper Clause, Article One, Section 8, Clause 18, where Thomas Jefferson uh, and, and, and Madison implicitly for that matter basically argued that um, the, 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 that Congress could only kind of utilize the necessary and proper clause if something were truly, strictly, absolutely beyond a reasonable doubt necessary whatsoever. Hamilton took a kind of more pragmatic view that would kind of defer a little more to Congress to kind of pursue its vision of the common good. He basically, um, you know, he, he kind of outlines this a little bit in Federalist 33, I think is, is the one. Um, and, and long story short, uh, posthumously, after Hamilton dies, of course, in the duel with Aaron Burr, Chief Justice John Marshall in McCullough versus Maryland really kind of ex expressly adopts Hamilton's view of the Necessary and Proper Clause with his famous line, you know, let the ends be legitimate. Um, you know, we, we've all read that line in our common law class. Um, and, and, you know, it, it, that that kind of is common good originalism, honestly, right? I mean, where you kind of have two interpretive plausibilities. One is about shrinking the government, maximizing liberty at all costs. The other is a kind of a slightly more pragmatic view to allow actors to kind of pursue the common good within their constitutional spheres of orbit. We should err on the side of the latter. Um, my reading of the history is that Justice J Joseph Story was very much kind of of the school of thought. I think Abraham Lincoln as a statesman was very much of the school of thought. So even though I've kind of coined this term, it is not a particularly new or revolutionary idea whatsoever. Um, but to your question as to far as like what this looks like in practice, well, first we need some you know, we need some judges to kind of start doing this in judicial opinions, obviously. Um, that would be nice. Um, you know, I've had any number of kind of informal conversations with myself over the past couple of years with judges who are some degree of curious about possibly doing this. We'll, you know, we'll see um, what happens. But at some, you know, at some point when a, when a proper case or controversy comes before a judge or justices, obviously, in theory, uh, their desk, we're going to have to see actually doing this. And what that means is where you have, you know, a clause where there is a reasonable interpretive ambiguity, where there are plausible interpretations on, I, 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 you know, multiple plausible interpretations on a purely kind of historical exercise as it pertains to a certain clause, then we're going to need a judge to basically say, well, one of these plausibilities um, will do X, but the latter will do Y. And the latter plausibility, the latter interpretation is the one that, from my perspective, most actually executes or implements kind of the telos, the founding era vision, the animating spirit of the United States constitutional order. So, you know, one example of that, uh, to give you a different example than the free speech clause, would be kind of the 14th Amendment abortion dispute. So, you know, I think the historical kind of originalist, um, uh, you know, positivist school of thought, Justice Scalia certainly said this, Judge Bork, they famously argued that the 14th Amendment is silent on the issue of abortion because the Constitution makes no claim as to value judgments or morality or things like that. Therefore, kind of Roe versus Wade and Casey versus Planned Parenthood's reliance on the due process clause to kind of get you this, this abortion um, right was, was misplaced. And, and, and properly speaking, the 10th Amendment um, you know, reserves this power to the states to do whatever they want. But there obviously is an alternative school of thought. Uh, Professor John Finnis, the great natural law philosopher last year in an April, the April issue of First Things had this essay called Abortion is Unconstitutional. Uh, my good friend Josh Craddock has done good work on this as well in the Harvard Journal of Law and Public Policy. The basic argument there is that the Equal Protection Clause, the 14th Amendment, when it refers to protections, or excuse me, when it refers to persons, was understood to mean actually encompassing un the category of unborn persons. Therefore, if a state has homicide laws that protect born persons but not unborn persons, then they'll be violative of the Equal Protection Clause as kind of a category, as category error. Um, there is really kind of ample evidence, I think, on both of these on both of these possibilities. It really does strike me as a, on a purely historical level, it strikes me as a fairly close call. Um, so, what the Common Good Originalist would do, who was kind of tasked with with surveying this, would would effectively concede that there is evidence on both sides. But because abortion is the most quintessentially unjust act, is the taking of innocent human life, it is so manifestly contrary to the telos of the American regime, which is, which is founded uh, on, among other enumerated ends, the establishment of justice. And therefore, we should err on the side of the latter interpretation. Um, so it does allow, and I think would not just allow, it, it, it urges, it exhorts kind of constitutional actors to 
to argue in terms of expressed terms of political morality. So in that case, it is not that different from Professor Vermeule's comic of constitutionalism. The difference is that I'm kind of instructing or urging, I should say, um, constitutional actors to cabin the range of possible interpretations of, of possible plausibilities within what might be, um, you know, otherwise historically legitimate as a matter of original public meaning. Um, now, one quick note as well: there's no reason why this act necessarily, this act, sorry, being the implementation of common good originalism, there's no particular reason why this has to be limited to um, Article Three to the federal judiciary. I think it can and should be implemented in Article One in the Congress and Article Two in the executive branch. So, for example, you know, if I were a United States senator. And I was I was thinking about um, you know if if I had an idea whether it's kind of antitrust, big tech, whatever, some sort of kind of um, co commerce clause inducing thing, I would be trying to analyze the constitutional justification for whatever legislation I was trying to do more through the lens of what is best for the common good as opposed to what is best for kind of you know shrinking government and maximizing you know uh, individual autonomy at any all costs. You can kind of think through that lens when you're kind of drafting legislation and thinking through the constitutional justifications of legislation. Similarly, you know, if I were kind of in Article Two, if I were, you know, a undersecretary or somewhere somewhere else in kind of the administrative state, I would be thinking about kind of my rulemaking under APA, the the Administrative Procedure Act. I'd be I would be thinking about my rulemaking again through the prism of trying to do what is best for the common good within my limited sphere of constitutional um, uh, legitimate influence as well. And I, I would be um, remiss if I didn't ask you about one topic in current affairs um, that we've discussed at the law school, um, and it's on the nomination of uh, Judge Kintanji Brown Jackson to the Supreme Court. Um, she described her judicial philosophy as independent, uh, but some members of the Senate have asserted her record of sentencing on, on uh, for her personal views uh, would indicate that she would probably be the furthest justice to the left on the court. Um, Based on your review of her confer um, the confirmation hearings, her record, opinions, or whatever else you have seen, uh, do you think that this will uh, substantially affect the balance of the court? Uh, I mean, yes and no, right? I mean, look, on the one hand, um, you know, she's repl she's replacing uh, Justice Breyer, obviously, who has been a fairly consistent um, liberal-leaning vote for about three decades now. So this is not kind of the seismic ideological shift that we saw when Justice Amy Coney Barrett replaced Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, for example. So, I mean, to that extent, no. Um, on the other hand, she is fairly young. She'll be doing this for decades. And based on everything that I've read and everything I've seen, you know, I, I entirely concur in the proposition that she is a leftist and that she will be a Sonia Sotomayor style progressive. I have no doubt whatsoever that she will kind of join Sotomayor on kind of all of her kind of, you know, far left crusades. I'm thinking, I'm thinking here, just to kind of give you one concrete example, um, there's, there's a 2014 case out of the state of Michigan called Shuet. Shuet was basically a question as to whether the state of Mis Michigan, whether the people of Michigan could, through their own ballot box initiative, actually ban affirmative action in the state of Michigan, which of, of course they can. I mean, affirmative action itself, I would argue, is unconstitutional. So the notion of people can't then voluntarily ban it, I, I think is truly wild. Um, nonetheless, um, Justice Sotomayor writes this, I, I would say, outrageous 55-60 um, page dissent trying to argue that the people cannot even voluntarily ban it, meaning that affirmative action, which is race-based discrimination, is required. Um, you, you know, Elena Kagan did not join that. Um, Ginsburg, if I recall, did, but Kagan did not. Breyer certainly did not. So on cases like that, where like Sotomayor is like truly like out on her own, which happens not that infrequently, you know, there are some areas as well. Um, the religious liberty is another kind of area that comes to mind. So I'm thinking here of kind of like the Masterpiece Cake Shop case of 2018, which is a fairly limited holding. That's the case out of Colorado, of course, with um, Jack Phillips, his poor baker, who just wants to make his cakes and not have his religious scruples violated. Um, I'm thinking of a case like that, where it was a 7-2 decision where uh, Kagan and Breyer joined uh, the fairly, not fairly, extremely kind of moderate, mealy-mouthed majority and Ginsburg dissenting. Um, a case like that, I would fully expect Katandi Brown Jackson to, to flip from her former boss, Breyer, and kind of join Sotomayor. Um, you know, I think that's like her confirmation hearing. I mean, she had that exchange with Senator John Cornyn. It was a really telling exchange. Senator Cornyn, of course, the senior senator from Texas. And Senator Cornyn, you know, 
they're talking about same sex marriage in the Obergefell case. And he kind of says, you know, what is your view as to kind of the evolving nature of religious liberty and how it interacts with uh, the constitutional right that the court pronounced in Obergefell? And Katanji Brown Jackson kind of just shrugged her shoulders and was like, Senator, that's just the nature of a right. Uh, you know, and she, I, th- I, th- I think that's basically how it, uh, it kind of like stopped right there. You know, the translation, like what, what you hear when you hear her say that is, you know, uh, shut up, you homophobic, transphobic bigots, and just, you know, take a knee before our agenda. That's basically what she's saying. Um, so I, I, I am pretty confident that she's going to be a far left member of the court, not just a center left member. Her career track record of being a public defender does not augur well in far as as far as kind of her jurisprudence on Fourth Amendment, criminal procedure issues, law, law and order, search and seizure, things of that nature. At the end of the day, you know, all the left wing groups, whether it's NARAL, Planned Parenthood, uh, Human Rights Campaign, Soros Affiliate, Open Society folks, they all wanted Katanji Brown Jackson. OK, they all wanted her and not any of the other kind of final content contenders. Uh, not Judge Childs at South Carolina, not Justice Kruger out of California. They wanted Katanji Brown Jackson. And they wanted Katanji Brown Jackson because they know exactly what they're going to get. Um, and I haven't even touched on, obviously, the, the whole child porn discussion, which I, which, I, which I think Senator Hall and Senator Cruz are absolutely correct um, to flag as deeply troubling. So I've, I've seen a lot of troubling data points. I think, she's, I think that she will be a very left-wing judge. No doubt about that. Well, we only have an hour, and I think there are some people who want to ask you some questions. Um, so we have some in advance, but um, our vice president, Marcus Lucky, is in the room now, and I was going to go to him for those questions. So, uh, Marcus? Thanks, Anthony, and thank you, Josh, for taking the time to speak with us. Uh, the first question we have was submitted to us prior to the discussion. Uh, you already hit on this a little bit, but in Gonzales v. Raish, we have two widely praised conservative jurists, Scalia and Thomas. They wrote fundamentally different understandings about the necessary and proper clause. Thomas took a narrow view of the clause, uh, saying that the court was casually allowing the federal government to strip states of their ability to regulate interstate commerce. While Scalia, on the other hand, wrote that Congress may regulate non-commercial interstate activities from the necessary and proper clause. The Supreme Court in Sebelius uh, adopted the Scalia approach, but in your opinion, who is correct and was the common good originalist approach to what is necessary and what is proper? And then how are they different in your mind? So great question. Um, so Gonzalez versus Reich is an interesting case. Um, uh, look, I, I actually, I, I invoke this case at, at my Common Good Originals event usually as an example of a case. A lot of people ask me, you know, the common questions are, one, how would you diverge from positivist originalism, from old school originalism? But the corollary to that question is, how would you diverge from Professor Vermeule? Right. Um, and I think this case actually is probably an example of where he and I would probably actually disagree. Um, the Second Amendment, Heller, would probably be another example. He's been famously critical of that decision as well. But Gonzalez versus Reich, look, you know, if I were a monarch, okay, if I could just rule over the United States in a day, I would ban marijuana tomorrow. I, I, I am hardcore on the drug stuff. Um, on a very personal note, my cousin um, overdosed a, a few years ago, not for marijuana, but still, I mean, I, I, I am, I'm quite militant on the drug issues. I fully supported Jeff Sessions as, when he was attorney general prosecuting marijuana as, as federal offenses, things of that nature there. So if I were king for a day, I would totally just ban this stuff. But the fact pattern in, in Gonzalez versus Reich, if you, look, if you think back to what it was, the question was whether someone in California could, if, uh, again, if I remember the facts correctly, could grow marijuana in his backyard for solely his own consumption. Like not even, like this wasn't even just like an intrastate issue. This was like an intra-household issue. Um, so I think this is pretty far removed, to be honest with you, from kind of the Hamilton-Madison necessary and proper clause debate. If you kind of just look at the basic words of the Commerce Clause in particular, you know, it's, it's obviously referring to kind of commerce between the states, um, and, and, you know, and, and cannot necessarily reach interstate conduct or at least interstate conduct particularly neatly there. Um, I think it's a real stretch to reach Justice Scalia's opinion, honestly, in the Gonzalez versus Reich case. I would like to get there, again, because I, I abhor and despise drugs and would like to see them all eradicated tomorrow. But I, I think it's a real stretch. Um, whereas, you know, I, I, I would suspect, I, I can't speak for him, obviously, but I would suspect that if Professor Vermeule would probably agree with his former boss, Justice Scalia, on that one, 
um, again, because he is not necessarily tethered by any kind of semblance of original meaning or anything like that. Um, but you know, there's, a, there's, there's, there's an ample amount of founding era evidence as to the scope of the Commerce Clause power. And it's, it strikes me as very difficult to imagine that it could have possibly reached that, even if I would like it to in theory. Thank you. So the, I guess the next question is a personal question I have. So if the conservative majority of the Supreme Court overrules Roe in the Dobbs case uh, the summer, presumably, who would you like to see write the opinion? Wow. Um, well, look, I think like optically speaking, it has to be Amy Coney Barrett, right? I hate to play that game, but um, that is the way the game is played these days. I mean, I think it would make sense, um, obviously, for, you know, the sole kind of conservative woman to write the opinion that deals with Roe versus Wade. I, 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 it's crappy, for lack of a better term, that we have to kind of think along those lines. But, you know, <clears throat> after Ginsburg died, it was crappy that you know, that, that, that President Trump, you know, confined his entire list of possible nominees to women, right? I mean, but to, to, to a limited extent, we kind of have to play their game. We can't just go too far above and beyond. Um, we, we could, um, but, you know, within a limited extent, we probably at least should. Um, emphasis, emphasis on limited extent. So to that end, I think it probably should be just Sammy Coney Barrett you know, in theory, who would I most love to see on the current court write the decision ending Roe versus Wade? I, I, I mean, look, I mean, I, I would love to see Justice Thomas write, obviously. I mean, you know, he was one of the dissenters as far back as Planned Parenthood versus Casey, one of his earliest years on the court. Yet, you know, he has repeatedly over the years, you know, decried the court's abortion jurisprudence. Um, you know, Justice, Justice Scalia really should have been the one to write the overturned Roe case. Obviously, he did not live long enough to see that. Um, so, you know, in theory, it'd be nice to see Justice Thomas write it, but I think uh, pragmatically speaking, it really has to be Justice Barrett. So, uh, Josh, thank you for coming to uh, speak with us. We really appreciate it. I just had a quick question about the makeup of the Supreme Court. So, obviously, Justices uh, Thomas Alito and Scalia are probably the most staunchly conservative justices we've had since the Reagan era. And uh, Gorsuch, Kavanaugh, and Barrett seem like they're going to kind of be more like an O'Connor in which you don't know which way they're going to go on some of the conservative issues. What do you think is a good way to talk to, tell a president advice about how to pick? And obviously, Justice Thomas is probably within the next decade also going to retire. What kind of justice would you like to see replace him on the court as well. Yeah, so this is one of the major areas, obviously, in which the conservative legal movement has generally failed, um, is that we have failed to do the reading. We have failed to kind of do the homework and consistently ensure <clears throat> that our justices and our judges um, have the track record, have the courage, have the testicular fortitude, frankly, to do what is right. Um, time and time again, obviously, we have been totally hoodwinked and, and bamboozled on this. Um, you know, Justice Kennedy, uh, who obviously ended up getting on the Supreme Court because the Democrats successfully spiked the nomination of Judge Bob Bork. But Justice Kennedy, back when he was first nominated, he famously, I've heard this from numerous people, he famously went around the Senate chambers, right? The, the judges, the nominees, they always meet with senators one on one. He met with Republican senators on the Senate Judiciary Committee. And you, he used to end his meetings before his confirmation hearing. This is Anthony Kennedy. And, you know, he famously said, you know, uh, I, he, he, he would like wink and say, I think you'll like my abortion jurisprudence. Um, and, you know, we saw what happened there, obviously, in Planned Parenthood versus Casey. Um, I, sh I shouldn't be smiling. It's horrific. But, um, you know, that, that, that mentality, which is the similar mentality going back to the, to the Bush 41 White House, George W. Bush. So famously, um, you, you know, for the seat that, that David Souter got, you know, famously, John Sununu of New Hampshire, who knew David Souter through New Hampshire circles, he famously said to George W. Bush, just, you know, trust me, I know David Souter. I mean, he's rock solid. Um, it, it was literally just this notion that, like, someone can personally vouch for someone, and that, and, and, and that is how it goes there. Um, David Souter was chosen over Edith H. Jones, a judge who I know a little bit because I clerked on her court, the Fifth Circuit. You know, and the rest is history and not particularly good history, obviously. So time and time again, we have just totally messed up here. Um, 
And a lot of it is that we have literally have just failed to do the track record. So Neil Gorsuch is a great example here. So his deviation in the Bostock case, the Title VII case, if you actually had done the reading, if you had done the homework, you would have seen that in 2009, back when Gorsuch was on the 10th Circuit, but he was sitting by designation on the 9th Circuit in a case called Castle, K-A-S-T-L, he basically foreshadowed exactly what he would do in Bostock. Um, he, I don't, I don't remember the precise fact pattern. It was very similar, and he, and 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 he, and he kind of had a writing where he basically said that this is kind of um, discrimination, uh, where, where the underlying fact pattern was not discrimination on the basis of sex, but discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation. It was right there if we had, if we had only done the reading. So first, it's just doing the reading, like literally not do, no more suitors and take that seriously. No more just like oh, I can vouch for him; he's a good guy. Like literally, pour over the track record. They do the freaking homework. Okay, two is. Another thing that I have said for, for a while is we have to kind of get out of the habit of nominating to the Supreme Court people who are overly focused on administrative state issues. This is getting back to kind of my earlier critique of the movement as kind of being co-opted by libertarian forces. I am, not a, I am not an apologist for the administrative state. I would like to see the administrative state defanged. I think it redounds against conservative interests. But I would be far more interested in nominating to the court jurists whose expertise are on various other issues that desperately need kind of a jurisprudential reform, areas like the First Amendment, the Fourth Amendment, um, you know, I, I just like basic issues of, of, of autonomy, human sexuality, civilizational sanity, border security, law and order, things like that. It is, we have, we have spent way too long kind of nominating people who specialize in the administrative state, kind of specialize in the DC circuit. I'm thinking here of judges like Brett Kavanaugh, who kind of fits that description to a T. So we have to stop doing that. We obviously should, probably, should, should place a greater emphasis on kind of nominating people, I think, from the American heartland. We, we need to stop this notion that you have to have gone to Harvard or Yale, have to have lived in New York or, or, or San Francisco. That is crazy to me. Um, obviously, that's not a panacea. Justice Barrett is a good example. She's from the American heartland. She has been okay so far. She has not been amazing. So that's not obviously not a cure-all, but it is just one possible thing to try and right this ship a little better there. Um, and then kind of another thing is like you have to be willing to actually use the Article Three power to make an impact. So what that means is no matter what your personal views are on any of these meaningful issues, from my perspective, if you take a, a very rigid view of stare decisis, of precedent, like if you agree with like what, what, what Chief Justice John Roberts did in the uh, – uh, Oh, crap. What was the case of Louisiana two years ago? Um, I, I, I can't remember the name of the case, but you know, he basically um, cited Star Decisis to kind of uh, stick by a four-year-old present. Four. Four. Um, it was a ridiculous view of Star Decisis. Yeah, I think if you agree with that, you're totally useless. Um, you have to kind of have some willingness to overturn flawed precedent because we are so far down this rabbit hole at this point. You have to be willing to kind of use the shadow docket. You have to have the courage to grant writs of cert in meaningful cases, things like the Second Amendment and concealed carry, things like that. And there we can kind of just look at the judge's biography, who, or he, who he, she, he or she affiliates with in their communitarian life and their civic life, if they're actually outspoken, what their track record is and op-eds, writings, things like that. So um, those are just a few ideas, um, but um, there's really no kind of one size fits all clear solution there, but certainly the way that we've been doing it has proved to be a manifest failure, I think. Uh, thank you. I guess we have one more question. Yeah, I just have um, kind of more of a personal opinion question. Who's your favorite Supreme Court justice uh, currently and ever and why? <laughs> um, sure. So, look, I I think Clarence Thomas is the greatest living American, uh, period. I, I, I think his story is an incredible story. If you all have not seen the documentary from February 2020, Created Equal, um, produced by Michael Pack. It's an incredible documentary film. It, it, his, his story is just a remarkable one. He obviously grew up dirt poor in the Jim Crow South, did not even speak English as his first language growing up. And then he, he you know, he emerged as kind of the leading voice for principled constitutionalism uh, on the court for, for decades. Um, as far as the specific jurisprudence of the judges, I'm a little more partial, I would say, to Justice Alito. Um, it's a close call, obviously. I think Justice Alito better encapsulates common good originalism, whether it's on things like the First Amendment, whether it's on things like the Fourth Amendment, on law and order, things of that nature. Um, I think Justice Alito is a little more in line. I, I, it's no accident, from my perspective, that Justice Alito was the one who I think was most peeved by Gorsuch's deviation in the Bostock case. He wrote the lead dissent in that case. 
Um, I know, or at least I think I know that he was um, privately extremely annoyed at Justice Gorsuch over what he did there. Um, so he really, I think, kind of better fits common good originalism a little better. Uh, but that's a close call, obviously. I mean, to my mind, those are like clearly the two best justices on the current court. Uh, kind of take your pick, if you will. Um, historically speaking, oh, man, um, it's a tough question, obviously. Um, you know, look, I think Chief Justice Rehnquist was 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 incredible. Um, he, he, you know, he, he understood kind of the nature of the culture war, I think, extremely well. He was one of the most courageous dissenters. Of it. He was one of the only two dissenters in the Roe versus Wade case. But she just Rehnquist's jurisprudence on law and order issues, I think, was was simply fantastic. On public religiosity, on establishment clause issues, he was fantastic. But as far as like, I hate to give like a very like basic answer, but if I had to like truly tell you who my favorite justice of all time was, I'm probably going to go with John Marshall. Um, you know, John Marshall obviously was the one who um, legitimized the federal judiciary as an independent body. Um, he very much was kind of of like that Hamiltonian kind of uh, persuasion when it comes to kind of a more kind of common good nationalist view of the enterprise. Um, I, I think just I think John Marshall is probably one of the great unsung heroes of the early era American Republic. You know, I mean, George Washington obviously properly gets the most credit for kind of getting America up and running and not kind of seeing us devolve back to kind of, uh, uh, you know, either anarchy or kind of tyranny. But, I, I, you know, I, it's entirely possible that without kind of the great judicial statesmanship of John Marshall for over three decades in the early 1800s, it's entirely possible that our constitutional fabric today, our constitutional order would look a heck of a lot different and probably not for the better. All right, Josh, I think we're running out of time here, but um, thank you so much for talking to us at, up at the University of South Dakota Knudsen School of Law. Um, uh, we're excited about all the things Federalist Society we're going to do this coming year, and uh, we're happy that we get to start off this event with you and talking in this discussion with judicial philosophy. So thank you again for coming. Yeah, no, thanks for having me, guys. I really appreciate it, and hopefully we can do it in person sometime soon. Hopefully, sorry, sorry it didn't work out this time, but uh, really Semester enjoyed it. Soon. Yeah, absolutely. So thanks so much, guys. Really, really enjoyed it.